It is appropriate today, if you'll notice <clears throat> the way the sanctuary is decorated. Uh, this is Pentecost. <clears throat> some refer to the birthday of the church. You know, some people get a little alley when you say that. But that's where I remember you can't have any fun with scholars in the room. So, but uh, it is a day that we should should remember on our uh, in our history, for that's when the Comforter came, our Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the gift that was given by Jesus. So great, uh, and that's why we can pray that, fall fresh on me, because we have a way for that to happen. So. so let's continue in our study of living as exiles, and we're in First Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. Uh, I've titled this, uh, past this message, Fervent Reverence. Fervent Reverence. Verse 17, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the uh, historical narrative that has been preserved for us, uh, but Father, the truths that are here uh, that had to speak words of such encouragement to that first century church, but speak just as loudly to us today. So Lord, I pray that we will hear from your spirit, and we thank you for your spirit, and as, as he does fall fresh on us, Father, may our hearts and our minds be surrendered to hear what you would have us to hear in this place today, for your messenger, the same surrender, Father, so that the words that are spoken are the truths that need to be heard in this body of believers this morning. And we give you thanksgiving for all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So up until this point, and it's taken us a while to get through chapter 1, right? And so I will tell you that there's one more sermon in this series I'm going to preach. So I'm going to take a break from that uh, and then start a series on miracles. Uh, I've been uh, uh, reading through Eric Metaxas' book, Miracles, and, and just the way that he lays that out and and I thought, you know, I think it'd be good for us to come and take a look at some of those and, and really try to understand them biblically, but then how they apply to our lives as well. I, I, I think you'll enjoy it. If you want to know what I'm going to preach, read the book. <laughs> Actually, we're going to develop some messages out of, out of some of those accounts that he has in there. So Peter, up until this point, he's challenged uh, that first century group of churches to remember uh, who they are, that they are the chosen ones of Christ, that they have hope in salvation. It's an undefiled, it's unfading, uh, uh, it's imperishable, uh, and we have a great hope in Christ, and we are to live faithfully, and not only living faithfully, but in the process we are to serve others, and we're to be holy, uh, simply because God is holy. I mean, it, I, we can say those words, right? They just roll out of our lips, like, be holy, like, that's something good. No, it's something we work towards, but it is something that we need to grow in, that we need to mature in, and we need to take on the character of God. And we know that starts to happen within our lives and is born within us when we start to manifest those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, uh, gentleness, kindness, uh, long-suffering, patience. I think I've missed some, but uh, go to Galatians 7, and you can read the whole list for yourself. But when those start to be manifested in our life, we know that we are taken on the care of God, which is going to allow us in times of persecution, adversity, crisis, whatever, to be able to stand firm. I think Peter starts to make a shift from just reminding us about the hope that we have to now outlining how a follower of Christ can live out the challenge of living as exiles. How can we live that out? How can we uh, stand? And he's going to give very practical uh, 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 direction and that's over the next few chapters, so we won't get into all of that, but I think today and, and next week as we, as we understand the power and the um, authority and the richness that we have from God's Word uh, and understanding what it means for us to be in it and how to use it. 
But I think we need to start here, and that's understanding this idea of reverence. It's a simple little line in here. It's in verse 17. You are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time as living with, with strangers. I've added the word fervent. I think fervent uh, is, a, is a good word for me here because I don't want it to just become some kind of a piety kind of thing that I'm doing, some kind of religious reverence thing, but something that I'm really feeling. And what I mean by that, fervent just simply means having or displaying a passionate intensity. So our reverence is not something that's just uh, how um, quiet can I be, how, uh, uh, and we're going to talk about the word reverence in a little while, uh, but sometimes we, we, uh, we equate that with piety, which means, you know, our conduct, our form, our uh, being uh, almost Spock-like, <laughs> unflappable in everything that happens. That's probably a bad reference for anybody that doesn't know Star Trek, so just forget that. Uh, but it, it tends to mean that we are going to be void of uh, emotions. We're not going to respond to anything. And yet, I think what we need to have is a passionate, a fervent, an intense reverence of God, God our Father. He is the uh, object of our reverence, and, and, and Peter's going to lay that out for us here. And I think once we know, and we know what we have in our hope and our salvation, that, that glorious joy, that glorious hope that, that has been given to us, we need to now know where the roots of that come from. And it's, and it's in our relationship with God, who Peter is going to refer to here as Father. It's an interesting word, it's an interesting choice, and it's also an interesting way that he put that together when he said, we appeal to the Father who impartially judges all. And so he's wanting us to make sure that we understand that, one, God is sovereign, Father's over everything. He is the one that ultimately is judge over everything. And we need to know our relationship in that and in being judged by him. But really, if we just read that verse the way the translators, and, and I think most of them have it along this line, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourself in reverence during your time as strangers. That first part would be better translated if you call on him as Father. The word there really is if. And that word, if you'll, if you'll carry it out, especially in the context of what uh, uh, Peter's writing here, since or because. And we find that throughout the whole New Testament in relation. Sometimes it'll have the word uh, 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 if, but we un need to understand that word really means since. So since you call on him as father, and this is what Peter's trying to establish here at first, since you call on him as father. Now, what does father mean? And this isn't our typical word Abba here for father. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the word pater. And if we look at the word pater, it, 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 mean, it, can de it uh, denotes a number of things. It can be biological, it can be an elder, it can be someone of high respect. I think the use here that Peter is using is he's referring to and using Peter, and it would be a correct way, as Heavenly Father, or as some translators have taken it, Father of all believers. Father of all believers. So this is, the, this is our Father. This is what brings us into the body of Christ. We are adopted in. We are joint heirs with Jesus, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and he is our Father. But he also says he's the judge. And he says he judges impartially. Impartially simply means without respect to persons. And he says he's judging according to what work has been done. Now, in the life of the believer, now I get the whole thing. We're going to come. Uh, we're going to be given our reward. And, you know, as many gospel songs say, then we're going to turn around and give it right back to Jesus. You know, the reward for me is opening my eyes and seeing Jesus. I just want you to know. And that's what we need to know, I think, the judgment that we're talking about here. Impartially judges for what work he has done. I think it has application for all of those. I think it has application for our obedience and how we walk faithfully and serve him. But I also think it has application here that he's impartially judging, are you one of his? Have you given your life to Christ? We, if, since we call him in, on Father, we're understanding that the work that has been done in us is the work of transformation, of being born again, of surrendering our life to Christ and walking for him. 
And if we understand that, if we understand that we're a transformed person, we're a transformed uh, individual, that, that our sinful nature has been removed, we've been forgiven, and we now have the righteous nature of Christ living in us, this makes sense then in verse 17 when he says, so conduct yourself with reverence. And I've said, as exiles. And he says, as strangers. Same word, we, it means the same things. As, as foreigners in this land, it, it, this is not our home. Our home is a kingdom of God and we need to live in that. And he says, conduct yourself with reverence. Reverence, there, the word phobo or fear, uh, it trips a lot of people up. When they hear the word fear, uh, immediately they want to translate it the way we do in the West, and that I need to be afraid of this. And so I, you know, I, I come before the Lord, but I come with trepidation. I come with uh, uh, almost, I'm not sure I want to go into the presence of the Lord. I'm not sure what's going to happen. It's kind of like the people around the mountain when Moses was up visiting, uh, or God was visiting Moses on the mountain, they saw the thunder, the cloud, and they were afraid. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is in this word fear, and it's better translated as profound respect and awe. That's why I like A.W. Tozer's book, uh, The Awe of God. I think it's one that we could read every year that we, we forget to be in awe of God and who he is. It's something we need to be reminded, and that's why I come back to the idea of fervent reverence, that we keep it with an intensity and we understand who he is, and we give him that level of respect. It's a level of respect, uh, a level of honor, uh, and, and oftentimes the way that that's manifested in ourselves is the way that we fulfill our life of service to God. In other words, our lives should reflect the way that we live, the way that we conduct ourselves, the way that we live faithfully and obediently unto him and the way that others would characterize that is because of our profound respect and awe of our father we call him dad we need to we need to honor dad we need to reflect that in our life and peter says in case you forget let me remind you once again why you do this in verse 18 and 19 We've been, he says, we've been redeemed. And in particular, we've been redeemed from an empty way of life. That's really an interesting phrase. But first, let's deal with redeem. Redeem simply means to be set free, to be liberated, to be delivered. And we know that to understand that we've been delivered and we've been liberated from our sinful past, that which breaks our relationship with the Father. And because of that, we have been delivered to walk and live in him. We've been set free, we've been liberated, we've been delivered, and it says from an empty way of life inherited from our ancestors. Let's not get tripped up on this, but let's hear the truth of it. Inherited here simply means pertaining to the teaching and traditions handed down from our ancestors. You catch that? The traditions and teachings that have been handed down from our ancestors. In other words, what happens is we get into a mode, we get into a, 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 a rhythm to where we've done certain things so long in such a way that that now becomes the, the, the legal way for us to live out our Christian faith instead of being set free from that. In fact, what he's talking about here are the traditions and the teachings of the Israelites, and if we know something about those teachings and those traditions as they grew, I mean, it started out simple, right? Ten Commands, right? And listen, if we read the Ten Commandments, it takes us a lifetime to learn how to really live in those. That's enough. And it should guide us. But what the Pharisees and the scribes and, and others had done over the years, they kept adding to it, adding to it, adding to it, and taking everything that they could to where the law became so complex and so confusing and so uh, the traditions of them so uh, 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 deep that no one could really measure up to it. And she, you, know, you, know, you know what they did? They kept them. They honored them. They knew they were there. And when they needed to, they turned back to them. But for most of them, they didn't live it out. They said, that is way too much. I can't do it. We're going to figure out another way. If, you, if those who were in Sunday school a few weeks ago when, when uh, Ed Sladek showed a a sermon by Fred Craddock, uh, I, I, in that was a really powerful moment. Uh, I really like the line he used after that, and I've used it several times, but when he was talking about the Israelites, and it makes my point here, 
Because the year of Jubilee, when Jubilee would come around, uh, everything that, that you either lost, let, let's say you lost property uh, because you couldn't uh, up, uh, pay for it, or you borrowed money, you couldn't pay it back, anything that was yours originally, when it was Jubilee, then all of that reverted back to you. And so you knew that it was only going to be lost for a short period of time. Now you think about all those people that obtained that property and those possessions and that wealth. They had to give it back. They also knew that this was all going back. Well, guess what happened? They didn't practice it. They talked about it. It stayed on the books. They celebrated it. But no one actually practiced it. And that's what happens. And we cannot and we must not make, uh, get ourselves caught in the trap of being so comfortable with our traditions and our teachings that we aren't open to being set free and liberated and delivered and to live as God is calling us to live today. It's a worthy thing to reflect on. We, if not, what we do is we get into this comfortability and we get into compromise, we get into accommodating, and now we have to go back and do the whole sermon series of the seven churches in Revelation. And we don't want to do that. So we're going to choose to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit because we've been set free, we've been delivered, we've been liberated, and to move as he moves in us. And I really like this last section of verses, verses 20 and 21, because it's the foundation of why we believe. We believe in God because of Jesus, simply put. Because Jesus is our, oh man, you're getting better, all three of you. So, he really is the one that makes this happen in our life. I love the description that Peter gives us here. Jesus was spotless. He was unblemished. He was referring to it as, as that spotless lamb. Uh, he's definitely tying that to Old Testament uh, uh, sacrificial practices of, of when you brought a land that had to be without spot, it had to be without blemish, it had to be that perfect land. Jesus was that ultimate, perfect, spotless, unblemished land. And he shed his blood. And the passage that, that Alan read for us in Ephesians, and, and certainly his whole meditation today, should give us pause to think about how great a love our Father has that he sent his Son uh, to be that spotless, to be that unblemished land and to shed his blood that we could be redeemed, that we could be set free, that we could be liberated, that we could be delivered. Peter also says Jesus was foreknown. That word foreknown to me, it really stopped me for a while, and I, I put it in, I took it out, put it in, and took it out, because I didn't want this to be so dry, but I think it is something uh, to know. It is simply to know about it before it happens, to know about it before it happens. And I thought, well, the only one that would know that would be God, you know? And so, I mean, there's trust in that, right? And, and it should build our confidence. But as I go along with it, and I ref, uh, ref, reflect on last week's message about the prophets and what they knew and what they were told and how they revealed about Jesus. And so we need to understand that, that we have the opportunity to continue to know about this before it happens. And that's the message we get to go out and share, right? As the prophets share that message, as they told about the coming Messiah, and he came... We now get to our message. If you want to be a prophet, you go be a prophet and go out there and tell people he's coming back. He's coming back. We don't know when. We don't know the like, specific time. But we know he's coming back. And I know about you, but that's a good message to be able to share with someone. Now, I know it's going to be weird to them, right? Our whole faith is weird. Born of a virgin, put to death, raised from the dead, send it to the Father, and coming back, we live in a world and a culture in particular that's just going to look at us like, how are you hanging on to these old ancient teachings? It is because these old ancient teachings remind us of who we are, of who we belong to, who we've been chosen by, who we've been called to be because of Jesus it says here, Peter says, Jesus was revealed in the last times. Remember, that's how I understand last days. Now, I'm not getting totally into eschatological stuff of when he's going to return. But those last days began the day he ascended back to the Father. 
And it is appropriate Pentecost being today that we recognize that he raised up the church and gave us his comforter. And he's still being revealed. He's being revealed in us and he's given us the wonderful privilege and blessing and opportunity to go and reveal him to others. And Peter finally says he was raised from the dead and was glorified. And I think we dealt with that last week, that we also will die, but we will also be glorified. That is the hope that we have in Christ. We can believe that all because of Jesus and what he's done on our behalf. We have a hope. Jesus gave himself. He was the perfect spotless lamb. He shed his blood for us. He was revealed to us. And he's coming back for us. And this is the hope that we have. And I think that hope is kept alive by our fervent, intense, passionate reverence of who he is. Of who he is, what he has done, and catch this, what he will do. Isn't it good to know he's still at work? We can look at the world in a lot of filters, a lot of eyes, and go, where is God? What is happening what is taking place? But I know he's still at work. He's at work in you. He's at work in me. He's at work in our body. He's at work in his church globally. Our lives need to reflect that. Let us not be downcast. Let us not be swayed by the things of the world. Let us not be uh, placed into this paralyzed because of looking at all the wrong and bad that is out there. But let us fix our eyes on the hope that we have and let our lives reflect that in the way that we're all inspired by him and let it be passionate and intense for his glory and honor. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Father, I thank you that we can be encouraged, that, that we have something we can be passionate about, something that is everlasting, something that, that we know deep within our being to be true and real. And so, Father, may we make much of Jesus in our lives every day. May, may that idea of being passionately, intensely reverent in the way that we live our lives, a lives that reflect our love and our respect and our awe of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.